Hi, I'm Rich Colgar, publisher of Forbes, and today I'm in Itasca, Illinois, with Paul Darley, who's the CEO of W.S. Darley & Company, which for more than 100 years has made fire engines to fire suppressor equipment, and, and welcome. And uh, tell us a little bit about the history of W.S. Darley. Yeah, sure, Rich, thanks. Uh, my grandfather, William S. Darley, started our business in 1908 here in Chicago, not long after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, which was really probably the impetus for his business. And he actually modeled the business originally after Sears Roebuck's catalog. So he came out with a catalog that um, was sent all around America to with municipal supplies, law enforcement equipment, firefighting equipment. And that really uh, launched his business from 1908 until 1926. And in 1926, he decided he wanted to get into building fire trucks. So he went and had a historic meeting with Henry Every Ford. Every little boy's dream come true. Every little boy's dream come true, you bet. And in 1926, he went and had a historic meeting with Henry Ford. And back in that, uh, back in those days, all of the fire truck builders man manufactured their own cabin chassis. Nobody had ever manufactured a, uh, a, a fire truck on a, a Ford chassis. So Ford said, "Sure, I'll sell you this uh, chassis to build your own fire truck." And lo and behold, in 1926, he introduced the very first commercial fire truck uh, for the fire service market. And what was remarkable about it was back in those days, all of the fire truck builders were selling their trucks for four to five thousand dollars, while leveraging on Ford's expertise and my grandfather. Father, you know, took that one step further with the standardization, a very cookie cutter type of truck. He introduced a complete fire truck for $695. So wow. It really we talk a lot about disruption today and disruption economics and, and uh, as if it were new. Yeah, right, right on, exactly. And that's really upset the market. And in fact, so much so that um, in the 1927 to 1932 years, all those fire truck builders said, what are we going to do about this disruption? What are we going to do about this Darley company who's selling fire trucks out of a catalog, you know, and back in those days, Sears Roebuck even selling homes out of their catalogs, right? Um, and so they all said, and this was before some of the antitrust legislation, the Clayton Act and the anti, uh, Sherman antitrust laws that took place in 1932 and 33, which my grandfather was actually instrumental in, uh, in, in forging some of that legislation. But all of the fire truck builders said, we're going to go to the pump manufacturer and if it will make it so that nobody will sell them a pump so they can't build a fire truck. And my grandfather was left with the option, do I get out of the fire? truck business or do I begin building my own fire pump? And he ultimately found an engineer who said, I'll build a pump for you, but I want to do it up in northern Wisconsin, in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, where the lumber industry had just moved out. There was a great surplus of German craftsmen in the area. And since and so we began building our first pumps in 1933, which is really kind of our core business today, pump manufacturing, whether it's for firefighting or other applications, fire sprinkler pumps, uh, fuel transfer pumps for the military. And today we're still in Chippewa Falls with our headquarters here in Chicago or in Itasca, a suburb of Chicago. Yeah, but I want to touch on uh, some of the convulsions that have happened in the economy over the last 10 years, and particularly the financial meltdown of 2008 and its impact, ongoing impact on state and local budgets, and how has that affected uh, fire departments and and uh, your customers. Yeah, I would love to tell you that we had all this great foresight that uh, you know we saw the economy for municipalities going down the tubes. We didn't, but we clearly did recognize in 2004 and 2005 that we had all our eggs in this one shrinking, diminishing basket of firefighting equipment, primarily domestic. We made a very concerted effort at that time to change our strategic direction and come up with a new five-year plan that put number one, our strategic initiative at that time was export, followed closely by defense. In 2010, we came up with our next five-year plan, and therefore, and then we shifted at that time to make our number one initiative defense and our number two initiative export. So, since uh, we and we've been very successful in the in the defense area, despite the sequestration and all of the budget cuts happening, um, you know, because our company is getting such a small piece of the pie, we've been able to go and leverage our current strengths. Whether it's a pump manufacturer, we just were awarded an 82 million dollar contract from the Marine Corps. We're we're actually taking what historically has been a fire pump, we made adaptations to it, and now it's going to be a fuel transfer pump, 1,500 of them for the U.S. Marine Corps. Likewise, we did a very similar type of move on our uh, distribution business. So we still have catalogs and electronic websites for firefighting equipment and law enforcement equipment and Homeland Security. What we did there is we leveraged that position. We were able to convince the Department of Defense that, look, Providing equipment for firefighters is not that different than providing equipment for warfighters. And so today we've been blessed with some uh, awards for um, uh, DLA for um, where we have contracts or we're one of four companies who pretty much equips every soldier today with the, uh, from head to toe with the exception of his weapons, his ammunition, and his food. 
Yeah, well, you, you, I think you're being humble. You said that you didn't plan for this in advance, but you were able to pivot pretty fast. We did, and I, I shouldn't say we didn't plan. We did plan in advance. We didn't really see the, the, the municipal budget crisis coming. And one of the key drivers, I should you know, probably state, Rich, is um, the key driver for our growth. You know, we're not really just trying to grow for growth's sake. You know, we've got a really strong outside board of directors, which includes uh, you know, a, a professor at Harvard, a general, Peter Schumacher, uh, you know, one of our uh, Sam Skinner, who used to be chief of staff for uh, President Bush 41, and all of these board members who came onto our board, not for the monetary reasons, we, we actually pay them very little, but they came on to contribute. Every one of them said, look, I'll come and join your board, but I'll do it only if this company really plans to grow. And I said, this is perfect because actually our whole reason for wanting to grow from a $100 million company to a $500 million company is because we're a third generation family business right now. There's 16 of us who own the business, 10 of whom work in the business. We've got 32 coming up in the next generation. So we realized about five or six years ago that if they come on at about the same rate that we came on, we're really gonna have to grow this trough in order to feed all these horses. And I use the word horses, yeah. not pigs. Okay, they're horses. So we're really gonna have to grow this uh, business in order to feed this next generation so that they can love this business and cherish it and be stewards just as we are. You'd mentioned that uh, no Darleys are guaranteed a job here and, um, and that it's vital uh, to take a job on the outside first and then to be paid market rates when, uh, when they come in. Correct. Yeah, so we actually, you know, as part of that family participation plan and our, all of our employees, whether they're family or not, are keenly aware of the, that family participation plan. We also, I suppose, when people come on, they, they do know, hey, I'm probably not going to be the CEO of this company. But they there's certainly have the ability to make it to a senior management team. And, and just part of our transparency, most of the folks who we bring on, uh, our, his, our you know, experience has been they're just fine with that. And it doesn't mean that you can't. We don't have actually a lot of rock stars in this business, you know, but we've got a lot of great people who collectively just get it and they just they work hard. They see a higher purpose. You know, I, as I look at our employees and I preach this all the time, you know, we're actually making life saving equipment here, whether it's water purification or fire trucks or fire pumps. And they really understand that, you know, they're not off making a stapler or widget someplace. They're really contributing to society and they have a higher sense of purpose. So we continue to preach that. We continue to take care of our employees. We have a turnover that's less than 2%, a voluntary turnover than less, that's less than 2%. Uh, last year we hired uh, 29 new employees. 20 of those were new positions within our company. Um, and so we as a business really just try to tell our story and inculcate our values into these new employees who come on. And our values, they all have a laminated card that tells, you know, that fits in their pocket that says, look, here's where we're headed. Here's our core values that's going to guide how we're headed there. And number one is integrity. Number two is relentless customer service. Number three is relationships that are built on respect. And there's other things as well, empowerment and innovation and lastly, celebration. So everybody gets those. They're very simple and they are, you know, we all eat, drink and sleep this every single day. And they really are able to come into an environment and see that it's natural, that it's really who we are, that we walk the talk. Let's talk about the difference between publicly and privately held companies in terms of their ability to recruit, retrain, and so forth. Public companies uh, seems to me have an advantage in a really booming economy um, where they can offer stock options and, and things like that. And, uh, but we don't have a booming economy. We have a pretty tight economy, particularly a tight employment economy. And the advantage goes to you guys in such an environment is my thesis. But what would happen if the economy suddenly starts taking off and headhunters are trying, you know, will they try to pluck your, uh, pluck your uh, top managers? You know, I'll t I continually hear, you know, publicly traded companies are so much more attractive than privately and easier to, you know. Well, in a booming economy. In a bo yeah. I know, I know, in a booming economy. And I got to tell you, I, I, I don't buy it really in any economy. And maybe I'm biased, or obviously I suppose I'm biased. But I look at a privately held business as being much easier to run. I mean, obviously we're not, we can make long-term decisions. We're not reporting to Wall Street on a quarterly basis. And when it comes to hiring and retention, in our opinion, you know, folks come in and they can really see the impact of their work. They can really go and, you know, and generally speaking, private organizations are going to be flatter organizations. So they're able to, they're, they, they're not going to face some of the frustrations perhaps that they would face in larger organizations that are very bureaucratic. So um, in our particular case, 
also, we continue, we offer a lot of those benefits and even much more so than some of the larger companies do. So I think the flexibility of being in a work environment that's private, and I'm talking primarily from experience, but I know a lot of other privately held businesses that are very similar. Um, I think the flexibility within the workplace is a great advantage. Our company happens to offer an incredibly generous profit sharing plan. It's a legacy plan that was started back in the, you know, 70s. It continues on that, uh, you know, maybe some of the younger generation don't totally approve, uh, understand or look at it as a huge benefit, but by the time they hit their 30s and 40s and 50s, they certainly see the benefits of it. Um, and so I actually feel the, the benefits and from a retention as well as a recruitment uh, standpoint where people know that they can contribute, that they come in every day, what they're doing is having an impact, it can be noticed and it can be contributing to not only the bottom line, but contributing to an overall team environment that in my experience exists more easily in a privately held business than a publicly traded company. And you, uh, after uh, more than 100 years of being in business, you still have uh, the little boy's passion about fire engines, even though you make a lot more than that. Yeah, right. Well, I'll tell you, you know, we had to reinvent ourselves. And uh, clearly part of that reinvention was sitting back and looking at what new markets, lateral markets, can we be getting into where we leverage our current strengths. And as we looked at that, water purification, you know, here we're making pumps. So water purification was a very logical one. We're actually making mini drones right now. So anything that we, as we step back, we really had a blank piece of paper. We said, what we want to go after products that are, that the Department of Defense needs, that Homeland Security needs. We've, uh, you know, we looked at why is one of the reasons why there are f so many fewer fires. When I, when you and I were a kid, a fire truck used to roll out of a station. It was going to a fire about 40 percent of the time. Now it's four percent of the time. You know, there's no fires anymore. So we said, why aren't there any fires? Well, everything's get sprinkled, and all, you know, residential and commercial buildings are sprinkled. Everything's flame resistant, better electrical codes, fewer smokers. We said, let's get in the residential fire sprinkler business. So we just uh, purchased a company in the last month that uh, manufactures residential sprinkler systems. So um, just as a business, we are constantly stepping back, reevaluating ourselves. And what it allows us to do as a, as a privately held company that maybe a publicly traded company couldn't do is we're able to make that investment, long-term investment, and know that we're not going to get an immediate return on our investment, whether it's in a mini drone or launching HomelandSecurityEquipment.com. You know, we recently took out a half a page in the USA Today for that, uh, very unsuccessfully, yet it was a, an investment in going after the masses, which is something that we as a business have never done. We've always been focused in on fairly clear niche markets. So um, just reinventing our business has been critical, and it'll be critical as we move forward into the next stage of our, of our company's development. Well, you have a great board of directors. Uh, against which you can bounce these these ideas about where to where to put your capital. Absolutely, we do, and they continue to push us. And you know, it's great. You know, being in a family, and I, if you're in a privately held business, to anyone in a privately held business who doesn't have a, a board of directors or at least a board of advisors or something, I would tell you that's probably been one of the biggest reasons for our our growth. You know, we've tripled in the last five years. We've been one of the fastest growing companies here in Chicago for the last three years. Um, and it's really being pushed by an outside board who, you know, came on board saying, we'll come on board, but it's got to be for a higher purpose. It's got to be for growth. And probably the other thing they said is, I'm not going to come aboard only for optics. I yeah. mean, there, there are a lot of privately held, uh, particularly family-owned businesses that, that may have the vision of recruiting a big board of directors for optics, yeah. but are still going to make all the key decisions without checking in with the board. You know, i got to tell you, without exception, all of these board members serve on Fortune 500 boards, as well as on Darley's board. And uh, they all say, geez, this is the funnest board we're on. You know, you, it's amazing. We have a meeting, 90 days later, we come back, you guys already did it, you know? So there's no analysis paralysis that takes place at this company. You know, we say, look, let's go, you know, sometimes without very much marketing research at all, you know, very little due diligence, we'll make decisions and sometimes to a fault. But for the most part, you know, it, it's, there is a great book. It's not the big that eat the small, it's the fast that eat the slow. And so we as a business really go and say, we look at speed as our friend. And that's clearly one of the advantages of being a small business who uh, can act and react really quickly to changing markets.